morning, everybody. It is the end of June and we are at uh, June 27th already. And today we're going to be talking about the different bats that call New York home and just bats in general, a little bit about their biology, their diversity. And uh, right now is a perfect time to go out there and see them as more and more insects are out there at night. Um, these bats will catch hundreds, if not thousands of insects a night, both um, moths, mosquitoes, all that kind of good stuff. So bats are a great way to do all natural insect control. So uh, bat houses and things like that are super popular. So we'll talk about those as well. As always, if you have any questions, you can throw those in the comments. If you've got any sightings, you can put those in there too, or you can just say hi as always. So we love to know who's on. Um, but let's get started talking about bats and bats of New York. But first of all, bats are nocturnal and there are more than a thousand species worldwide. There's more than a thousand one hundred species of bats worldwide. They're sometimes called flying mice because they they do kind of look like flying mice. They're really small like mice are, but they're not rodents. They're in their own classification. They're their own order, everything. Um, they are actually more closely related to primates and people than they are rodents. So although they look like flying mice, they in fact are not. They are mammals, so they have fur, they're warm-blooded, they give birth to live young, they produce milk, and they're the only mammal that can truly, truly fly. You might have heard of flying squirrels, which we also have around here. They don't really fly per se, they just glide. So uh, the bats are really the only true flying mammals. Um, these flying squirrels, sugar gliders, they all glide. They don't actually fly around like the bats do. So as far as bats morphology goes, as far as how their body is set up, they have wing membranes that are supported by their bones and that allows them to maneuver super quickly. If you've ever watched one fly around, it's amazing how they can fly uh, just so amazingly and catch insects right out of the air, just like swallows do. If you ever watch tree swallows or barn, barn swallows, anything like that, um, they basically, uh, the bats are what are the nocturnal version of what the tree swallows and the barn swallows and purple martins, what they do, bats do during the night to catch these nocturnal insects that are around. So that is your typical bat morphology there. And bats also have specialized feet. So when they're at rest, the tendons of their feet are actually held closed. So that's how they're able to hang upside down even when they're asleep. So in order to um, leave, they actually have to expel energy to open up their toes. So when they're at rest, their tendons and their feet are held closed. So that's how they can easily hang upside down during the day when they are roosting and resting and they can tilt their heads super far back so they can look behind them as well so they have specialized feet and specialized vertebrae in their necks there are such things as fruit bats or mega bats these are these huge huge bats we don't have them around here in upstate new york or in new york at all we really don't even have them in the US. There's some down south and around Texas or so, uh, but over 500 species of plants depend on bats like this for pollination. So plants like mangoes, banana, agave, um, coca plants, they all are dependent on some of these bat species. And bats will eat the fruit and spread the seeds, and then they will also drink the nectar, which helps pollinate as well. So there are these giant bats called fruit bats or mega bats. Not going to see those around here though. Um, every once in a while we get people asking about bats coming to hummingbird feeders at night to drink the nectar. It's not really something you're going to see here because all of the bats that we have in New York are insectivorous bats, so they're eating the insects. Now if you get insects coming to your Hummingbird feeder at night, that's one thing. They might pick the insects off, but they're really not gonna be drinking the nectar. If you're down south, say you're in Texas, you might be getting some bats that do drink nectar out of your hummingbird feeder, but it's not really a thing here in, um, in the, the Northern US. So about 70% of bats 
eat insects. And one bat alone, just one single little bat, can eat thousands of mosquitoes in an hour. So they can make a really huge dent in the insect population uh, for the better that you have around, especially the mosquitoes. And all of our bats here in New York are insectivorous. So they have a diet that is consistent, uh, consistently 100% insects. Now there are such things as vampire bats too. We get that question a lot. There's only three species though of vampire bats worldwide. Um, they're native to Mexico and to South America and they do feed on blood um, but it's really the blood of birds and cattle so you don't have to worry about um, any kind of bats or vampire bats drinking your blood at all. So it's they they really go after cattle at night and um, livestock. So they don't go after people so much. Bats come in a range of different sizes as well. The smallest being this little guy. This is called the bumblebee bat. It's the smallest mammal in the world. It's only four centimeters in length. So they can be very, very small and they can be very, very big. So this is one of those mega bats or the, the big fruit bats. This is the golden crown flying fox that has a wingspan of anywhere between five and six feet. So there's a huge diversity of bat sizes as well. And all of our insectivorous bats use echolocation. And bat eyesight is actually quite good, but their echolocation is used to hunt in the dark. They make rapid little pulses of sound, uh, sometimes up to 200 of them per second. So if you're ever outside and you hear some little um, chirps, almost like some little um, clicking sounds, it's probably a bat. Now's a good time at dusk to go out and listen for that kind of a thing because you might be able to actually not only just see them, but to hear them making these little sounds as well. So those sounds will bounce off an object and that will come back to the bat and they're able to find their prey items and they can identify the size, location, the shape of the object. So really, really neat thing that they have adapted to do is use echolocation to find some of these insects as they are flying through the air. There are a lot of myths about bats. They get a bad reputation sometimes that they're all rabid and that they'll get tangled up in your hair. Um, bats, are uh, they don't have a higher percentage of being rabid than any other mammal. So it's really not something you have to worry about. And I've yet to hear of anybody who's ever gotten a bat tangled up in their hair. So they do have that really good echolocation. And if you ever feel like they are flying around you, they might be if you've got things like mosquitoes flying around you. So that's the only time I've ever heard of them getting close to people is if they've got a lot of uh, bugs around them, if there's mosquitoes going after them, um, there might be bats kind of in the general vicinity of you going after those mosquitoes. But I've yet to ever hear of anybody getting a bat tangled in their hair. They use that echolocation so they can find very, very fine things and they can find very big things as well and they don't want to run into um, a person. <laughs> There is something called white nose syndrome with, that you might have heard of as well. And this is causing huge declines in bat populations. And what white nose syndrome is, and this is a picture of a bat that's infected with white nose syndrome, is it's something that makes them stir more than they normally would. So during hibernation, they'll wake up more frequently, especially if they're disturbed. So a lot of the times these winter roosting sites that they have are sectioned off so nobody can get in them because if there's people doing any kind of cave exploration, that kind of a thing, and it causes the bats to stir, um, they will um, stir easier than they normally would. And the thing that happens then is they burn off the fat reserves that they have that are supposed to get them through the winter. So in turn, they end up leaving their winter roost sites early to search for food. But if it's too early, all that insect material is not out there for them to get and it can cause them to die. So the white fungus can be seen on the faces and sometimes the wings of the infected bats like this picture shows here. And it's caused an estimated 80% decline in bat species since 2006. So it's caused a huge decline in the bat populations. So that is the white nose syndrome. And unfortunately we do have it here in New York. 
there's different types of, of uh, groups of bats. So here uh, we've got cave bats and we have what are also called tree bats. And cave bats are these bats that spend the winter hibernating in large groups in caves and in mines. In summers, they spend their time in hollow trees under bridges, in buildings, beneath the bark of trees. They're usually a pretty plain brown color. They don't have hair on their tail membranes and they only have one baby per year. So that's another reason why these bat populations have gotten so low is that they don't reproduce very quickly either. At least the cave bats don't. They only have one baby per year. So that is another reason their populations are suffering. We do have six species of cave bats here in New York, and you can see they are all kind of plainish brown, and I'll show you what they all look like here. This is called the Northern Long-Eared Bat. It has large ears if you're able to see it up close, which a lot of the time you aren't going to be seeing any of these guys very close at all. It can easily fly through dense forest, so you'll find it in forested areas. It'll squeeze into rock crevices and in caves to hibernate. And this is one that's been severely impacted by the white nose syndrome. There is the Indiana bat, which is an endangered species in the state. They hibernate in large numbers in very few locations. And just half the Indiana bats in the Northeast spend the winter in just one New York mine. So that's another reason why this population is endangered. If anything happens to that mine or that population that's in that mine, um, that can really, really impact this species. The summer maternity colonies range from a dozen to several hundred animals in tree crevices and under bark and has a pink face that distinguishes it from the little brown bat. So a lot of these cave bats, they have very, very small differences from one another to um, identify one from the other. And this is the little brown bat. So this is the one you are most likely to see. This is the most common bat in New York. It's frequently found in buildings in the summer. It can be found in tree crevices or under bark, and it feeds low over water. So at dusk, if you are by any kind of a pond or marsh and you see a bat flying low over the water, it's probably going to be this little guy, the little brown bat. There's also the big brown bat. This is the largest of the New York cave bats. So its body is about three inches long and it has a 13 inch wingspan. And it uh, raises its young in small groups in buildings as well as in trees. It emerges early in the evening to feed high in the treetops. And its face, wings, and ears are black with no fur. So this is the big brown bat. So if you see something flying low over the water, it's probably a little brown bat. If you see something feeding high above the treetops, it's probably this guy, the big brown bat. There is what's called a small footed bat. This is our smallest bat. Its body is less than two inches long and its wingspan is about nine inches. It weighs less than a nickel. And if you're able to see the face up close, it has a raccoon style face mask. So it almost has this black kind of face, uh, face mask type of pattern on it. It raises its young on cliff faces, bridges, and rocks with good sun exposure. And most of these you'll find in the Adirondack region. So not super common here, um, at least where most of you probably are in the Rochester and upstate New York area, uh, the western New York area, I guess I should say. There's also finally, I think this is the last of our cave bats, the Eastern Pipistrelle. And this one's easier to identify because um, it doesn't have that as, as brown of, uh, of a fur. It has a reddish colored fur. They prefer warm caves, moist caves, will form small colonies in the summer near open woods and water. And they can often be mistaken for dead leaves hanging from a tree because they look so much like a, a dead leaf. They're that same kind of coloration. So the Eastern Pipistrelle is also known now as as the tricolored bat. And this is um, a picture of some of the eastern pipistrelles or the tricolored bats um, blending in with some leaves. So you can see why they can easily be uh, misidentified for dead leaves. You could walk past them and have no idea that they're even there. Now there are also what are called tree bats. The cave bats tend to hang out all together and they tend to form colonies 
the tree bats tend to be more solitary and the tree bats are also more colorful that we have here and we do have three species in new york of the tree bats they live all year round in trees so they don't go into caves or mines or anything like that um, they're more colorful they have a furry tail membrane so they look they look kind of fluffier than the other bats do. And they can wrap that around themselves like a blanket to keep warm. Now these bats also have more young. So they'll have two to four young a year. Most of them usually have two. And all three will uh, fly south in the winter. So these you can kind of identify pretty easily from one another because they are more colorful. This is the red bat and of out, out of all of the the tree bats that we have, this is the one you're most likely to see here in Western New York. They roost low in trees, blending really well with the foliage. Again, they can look like dead leaves. The males are reddish orange and the females tend to be more gray. They do roost alone and the females will give birth to twins and sometimes even quadruplets. So here's a picture of the red bat with a couple little babies there. So that is your red bat, the more common of the tree bats. But if you spend time in the Adirondacks, keep an eye out for this little guy. This is the hoary bat. This is the largest bat in New York. It's got a body size of three and a half inches and a wingspan of 16 inches. It's common in the Adirondack region and it'll roost alone high up in the treetops. Some of these tree bats too are the ones you might find under shutters. Um, people will, you know, go to close the shutters in their house and there might be a bat hanging out there or even underneath umbrellas. If you're putting up your, your umbrella and your patio set, something like that, sometimes there's bats hanging in underneath those. Those tend to be the tree bats, but they could be cave bats as well. So you might see something like the red bat there, the hoary bat, and then there's this one called the silver haired bat. And it does have silver tipped hairs on its body, which give it its name. It roosts under tree bark and in tree cavities. It prefers Northern habitats and will come out before sunset to feed. So it feeds a little bit earlier than some of these other bats do. The uh, bats here in New York primarily will mate in the fall and they're able to do that because the females can store the sperm in their body. The gestation time is about 40 days, um, anywhere between 40 days and six months, depending on the species. And in New York, caves and mines are too cold for raising the young. So the females will go to things like the hollow trees or bat houses, so some smaller cavities that get warmer. They do like it nice and warm in their nursery roosts. And the females will gather together in roosts to give birth and to raise the young. Pups are born in June to early August. So right now we're in that time where the, these little babies are being born. The newborn pups have well-developed feet and are soon able to hang upside down just like the parents do while the female leaves the roost. The mothers exclusively will care for the young and the young can't fly until they're about a month old. So one great way to attract bats is with bat houses. Like I said earlier, bats are an awesome way to naturally control insects. And each night, any individual bat can eat anywhere between 2,000 and 6,000 insects. So they can make a huge, huge impact in the insects that you have in your yard. Some things that you want to consider and do if you are putting up a bat house is to paint it a dark color, especially if you're here in more of a northern climate like in upstate New York, you want to paint the house black to absorb the heat. And the paint you want to use is an outdoor water-based non-toxic latex paint and mount it in a spot where the bats won't get tangled. So if it's in a spot that has, you know, tree branches underneath or shrubs, you want to avoid that because when the bats come out, they can get tangled in that. So you want to avoid that. So putting it on a pole is great. Putting it on the side of a structure, like a building is perfect. And you want to make sure it's up about 15 feet high if possible at least. And the houses mounted on poles and structures tend to become occupied faster than those on trees. So you want to put it kind of out in the open where it can get some of that light to absorb um, and to get nice and hot inside the house. More chambers equals more bats. So we've got all kinds of different bat houses here at the store. The smallest one we have is something like this, and you can kind of get an idea of the size of it. And this holds a dozen bats, and we have some that hold anywhere between 
two and three hundred baths as well. So you can get a whole bunch of different size houses, but the bigger the house, the more bats that you're going to get. And you'll be more likely to get something like those nursery roosts of the females with the babies. Larger houses also create more temperature fluctuation, which is good for them. And bat houses may become occupied any time in the season. So at any time during the spring and the summer months, you might start to see some bats getting into your house uh, or into your bat house because uh, once the males and females have mated, the males tend to go elsewhere and form their own roosts. So um, one thing to consider also if you've got a bat house and it's not being used by bats is to check for wasps um, because sometimes if wasps establish themselves in these houses, um, which they can do, the bats won't have anything to do with them. You do want to mount the house facing east or south if possible, so somewhere where it gets anywhere between six and eight hours of sunlight is optimal. Here's a picture of a bat house and they're all starting to kind of looks like climb out for the evening. And bats do migrate. So bats begin to migrate in the fall to cave and mine systems as in insect numbers decline. They live off their fat reserves all winter long. And they'll, some will stay all winter long in a hibernation state. Some of them kind of stir throughout the winter. Um, but in April, that is when they start to migrate back. So same time that some of these, some birds start to migrate back, um, bats are starting to come back to the area as well. So that is what I have for you guys today about bats. We do have a whole bunch of different bat houses if you are interested in attracting bats. We also have some poles that go up you know, 15 feet high so you can attract, um, you can attach the houses to those poles to get your bats. We also have some books about bats, um, Bat Basics. This is a really popular one. And if you wanna build your own bat house, we do have little guides on how to do that as well. So we've got a little bit of everything um, for attracting bats to your backyard. So looks like uh, I've got a comment here from Randy. It says, good morning, everybody. Had a house finch this morning. So Randy has a house finch probably coming to his feeders. The house finches have been very chatty. I've heard a whole bunch of them um, singing recently. Um, looks like that's everybody's comments for today. We'll be back on Saturday with another broadcast. And until then, have a great week and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.